Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, my name is Cliff Johnson. I'm president of the Cold Spring Area Historical Society. I have to grieve after that. <laughs> um, this, well, several, several announcements. Um, number one, it says restrooms downstairs, but if you can walk half the hallway, there's restrooms on the same level with in case you have trouble with the stairs. Um, there's coffee, water, uh, cookies, membership brochures. Um, you know, uh, they're here for the cards. Oh, they are. Okay. <laughs> So make use of all of that. Um, thank you, Bob. Kathleen for um, bringing the cookies. Um, that takes care of that part. Um, all kinds of little announcements. We are doing the fields receipts, so if you want to give us your receipts, um, uh, we got our first check. Actually, um, this month earlier. Anyhow, um, if any of you are here for Ray Schubiler, I apologize. You're not going to see Ray today. He's having surgery done sometime around this date. We're not sure when, but. Uh, He'll be talking about Cold Spring Fire at a future event. Um, last Saturday we were at the showcase and a lot of people helped us with pies, with just volunteering efforts at that, selling the pies, selling pizza, making pies. Um, talking with visitors at our booths. So thank you to all of those people. Um, coming events, I don't know if I can put them in order. Um, first one I'll mention, and that, we don't have that one up there, do you? Yeah. This is a senior center event, but it's kind of related a little bit. They have their quilt bingo coming up on April 14th. Um, the, the sign is posted, or you can talk to Nadine down there and um, get more details if you want on that. Um, Is looking for our next, there we go. April 19th, we're doing a joint uh, program with the um, Friends of the Library, William Nick Kruger, if any of you read fiction at all, um, well read or well written, however, well liked author, Minnesota author, has Minnesota settings. Um, won several awards, all kinds of things. He'll be here um, 6.30 on Thursday the 19th. And he'll have books and autographing and all that sort of thing if you're interested in that. Um, okay, on uh, June 15th, we're We've got the opportunity again to do a tap takeover with uh, Third Street Brew House. Um, it's, it's really a nice event and it's really a nice fundraiser for us. Um, uh, you know, when I first thought of it, I thought, well, I'm, I'm, I have one glass of wine for supper, right? Um, but it, it really is a nice event, family event, kids are there, everything, and we have a display. Um, but we have to kind of run the operation, so we need volunteers to, 
take beer orders and um, clean tables and uh, we'll staff our, our historic booth and sell pizza. Uh, so, you know, whether you would help with volunteering, come in and shouldn't encourage beer drinking, right? <laughs> Anyhow, um, it's a nice event and we could use lots of help with it. Um, oh, over on the table you will see, just backing up a little bit, if you need a reminder, just take, just take one, but it's a reminder about William Ken Kruger. Is that it for announcements? Sure. I know I've gone on long enough. Anyhow, um, you're here to hear Marilyn Brinkman. I think you all must be acquainted with her. She's authored how many books and she has a few here for sale. She's been writing, I won't say for years, but <laughs> lots of years for the same pot times. Interesting articles on real specific subjects, but really a lot of research goes into them and um, well written. Um, today she's going to talk about aprons, so welcome Marilyn. Nice to be here. I wish there were more people here, but that's all right. Uh, we'll go on anyway. Um, yeah, I've been writing for the same amount of times for 15 years now in March, and I haven't missed the story, and I do local history. Uh, and if you've read any of them, uh, I have a collection of them in the book here called uh, House Dresses, Decoys, Picking Rocks, and Other Stories. And I've got it for $10 now, and I have the uh, Richmond Tea Time that just break off the clock. Sell the rest of the books, so they're for five dollars. Thank you. Uh, and my subject today is aprons. Now, uh, aprons are pretty much a nostalgic item for most of us now because aprons went out of, out of favor in about the 1960s. Prior to the 1960s, they were very, very important. But by the 1960s, people started having uh, the, the finances to buy their own aprons, to make their own aprons, and women were wearing pants, so aprons weren't as popular anymore. And young people did not, at that time, want to emulate their mothers and wear aprons like their mothers did. And so it was sort of a rebellion, too. But aprons, as far as services were concerned, have been in fashion throughout history, and that's what I want to get into right away. Um, this is my great-grandmother on the on your right and the other woman is Mary Salto Scoldy. They were sisters in love. They came to uh, Stearns County, actually settled at Grand Lake uh, in 1858, so they were here quite early. And this is the type of apron that they wore. A long white apron because they wanted to keep their dresses clean. They probably didn't have a lot of money or a lot of fabric or a lot of clothing, especially if they just came because they only took the necessary things with them when they traveled, when they came from another country. And they came from Hungary. Actually, a part of that part of Hungary now is part of Austria. So I don't know if my heritage is Hungarian or Austrian. Because it's both. <laughs> Anyway, those are the aprons they wore at that time. And uh, the word apron comes from the French word napron, N-A-P-R-O-N, which means, actually means tablecloth. And so the fact that uh, a tablecloth covered a table, similarly, aprons covered a woman's body or whoever was wearing the, the uh, apron. So it's a French word, actually, and it was shortened to aprons. Uh, through, through the ages. And they were worn for hygienic reasons because they were clean and uh, it protected the dress underneath. They were easy to take off and throw in the washing machine, easily laundered. And they were worn as protection from dirt, wear and tear, from sharp objects, or from chemicals. Now, the chemicals would be in industries, for instance, even a shoemaker, uh, cobbler would uh, have certain chemicals 
that were put into the leather and the shoes, and especially a tanner would have to wear an apron because those were chemicals that they could um, uh, spill on themselves and they burned. And so actually many of those uh, uh, illnesses were aprons all the way to the floor and often made of leather. And in one story I read, they couldn't afford to have their hides tanned that they were going to use, and so they just took like a whole sheepskin and then tied it around their waist, using the part from the legs to tie in the back somehow. So if you couldn't afford an apron, you just use the pelt, an animal skin. Um, and from sharp objects, and that would be the uh, blacksmith um, and, and other industries that used to knives. Butchers, butchers certainly used it. Um, dirt, of course, and wear and tear, and save the dress. Okay, they were generally worn by poorer people. The real aprons were worn by poorer people or people who worked in the industry. And fabric was scarce, like I said in the beginning. And so usually the first aprons were just a small square. Don't, do our suit come up? I'm going to have a model. Uh, put one of those waist aprons on. Yeah, that one. This is one that I remember my mother wearing. She wore that in the kitchen every day. When she didn't want to wear a whole bib apron, she would wear this one. And um, it, it was easily put on um, the, uh, fabric that she had in her trash box, probably, scrap box, I should say, and she uh, wore that. Um, and, and it was, I can't remember the train of thought right now, but anyway, that's the kind of apron that was worn in, in the kitchen for hardworking women. So, okay, you can stay there if you like. Okay. Oh, uh, just a minute. Uh, actually, wealthy women started wearing them in medieval times when they discovered, for some reason, uh, the apron was worn by so many people. So wealthy people thought, well, there must be something about them that's really glamorous, so I'm going to get one. It said that the Duchess of Queensberry in Great Britain wore an apron that was all jewels. It weighed so much she had to have help when she walked. And it was worth quite a bit of money. Um, uh, carpenters and weight people, of course, wore, wore aprons, but they needed pockets. Uh, for instance, that one, it has a pocket in it, and uh, they needed a place to keep their pencils, their uh, tools that they used, so then aprons with pockets became popular. And uh, Rita brought one that's typical of that. I'm going to hold this up. It is pretty tattered. This is an apron that was definitely used. Cold Spring Lumber Company. Uh, the kind of apron where you could keep your tools, your hammer, your nails, tacks, whatever you were using, tied around your waist. And it was very handy. So those were um, uh, aprons that were very useful. Um, the pockets to hold the items. And they were made of cloth, rubber, heavy leather, or denim. And that one's probably made of denim or canvas. Okay. Now, I, the first time I did this talk, I did it for um, Hebrew Lutheran Church in uh, St. Cloud. And they had me come and talk at their spring tea. So uh, they had the table set beautifully out there. There were about 300 people there. Um, and each person was wearing an apron. Even the men were wearing aprons. And so as I did the talk, a lot of them incorporated what they knew of, about the aprons. And when they called me to do this talk, the pastor said she really wanted some religious significance in that talk. But she said in the Bible, the only place she could, he she could find where aprons were mentioned was with Adam and Eve. Their fig leaves were all with aprons. Actually, they were just fig leaves. Um, a loincloth. But as I was doing, looking for information on uh, religion and, and the apron, I came across religious art. And in religious art, there are lots of references, many, many with aprons. Here you see the woman on, on my right. Uh, she's wearing an apron. That's the Lamentation of Christ. This is a very famous painting. And on here, in the Book of Hours, the Book of Hours was a prayer book in medieval times that the people who could afford, afford these carried with them 
or had them in their homes, and they read out of those books each day. And there are lots of pictures, because pictures tell a story. And there's the serving woman. She's pouring water into the bath, is wearing an apron. Okay? This is the birth of Mary at St. Anne. And uh, the way, people who are waiting on Dan, St. Anne, her mother, are wearing aprons. The nurse, of course, is wearing a big apron. And I'll talk about those later. Because it covers her whole body. She probably dealt with the, the blood and the bathing and that kind of thing. Where the woman in the background is probably a visitor. She wore a, just a server. And she's wearing a smaller apron. And this goes to show that they had fun to it. They didn't take out their aprons. They had a good time. This is a, a, a scene of a dance, sort of a very riotous, wild dance. And the women are all wearing aprons. <laughs> so, really help me find out about the local aprons. She's got lots of historic photos and uh, it's not hard to find an apron, even even in Colstrip. So this was the early 1900s, the Central House Hotel here in, in Colstrip. And the women there are obviously in the kitchen, they're cooking, and they're wearing aprons. The long white aprons like my great grandmother wore. Mm -hmm. And the men wore aprons. They wore them at the Colstrip Brewery. Of course they needed aprons, there was a lot of uh, swimming and things going on. So they had their aprons in, in the brewery also. And this is, of course, Peter's Market. Everybody remembers this. Who remembers Peter's Market? Sure, everybody remembers Peter's Market. And of course, this is Gustav. Gustav Peter's making sausage. So the butcher, the baker, the candlestick baker, they wore aprons. And this happens to be uh, the butcher uh, making sausage. So naturally, he would be wearing an apron. Dolores, would you put that one on? The white one here? And those are also uh, aprons that have labels. But this one has someone gave me. It happens to be Jenny O in Melrose. And the apron has the emblem advertising. The apron is actually advertising the business, as is uh, Cold Spring Lumber here. By wearing this apron at someone else's home when they're working, of course, they're also advertising the lumber company. And there's Jenny, who I should really for this. I've had a golden plum paper, so I'll accept that sometime from someone. Um, and then this Peter's grocery store again. It was on Main Street in Cold Spring. You would all remember that? I shopped there, and Peter's workers behind the counter, and you can tell they're wearing white tops, which is probably in their apron with, or white shirts when they were serving the people. So they're still considered aprons. And the Cold Spring Creamery workers, of course, in the creamery, they, and look at the length of those aprons. They went all the way down to the floor. I'm sure they didn't have an easy time walking but they could wear their uh, apron all the way down to the floor to again also protect their feet and, and their legs from chemicals. Okay? And there's another style, Lawrence, you want to put this one up? Another style apron is called the pinafore apron, and that one has the top on. Um, and, and in this case, there were ruffles there. And this is, you can see, School District 14 offers facility for residents to come to the facility to do their canning. And uh, mom comes in wearing an apron. Similar to that, at least, it has the top. Now this one I bought at the Coastbury Bakery about six or seven years ago. And it's, it's a more current apron. It's reversible. <laughs> Thank you. She's a model. <laughs> uh, and it's got cute little pockets, ties in back. And uh, it's the kind of wear apron that I wear now when, if and when I fry bacon. You've got to have an apron on or you get your, your clothes all splattered. Okay? And then these are other versions of the pinafore apron. And the one on the right, my right here is called, actually called the granny apron. Because it's probably what grandma wore. She had to evolve from the long white apron to something a little more stylish. And so that sort of evolved. The one on the left is a memory or a signature apron. Uh, it, sometimes when people 
for instance, now at their wedding, they actually have some piece of uh, fabric or, some, or even, even an apron in some cases where everybody autographs. Or I've seen one where they have dish towel and everybody autographs the dish towel. So that's a memory apron. And here's the cold spring lumber, which I've already talked about. And they were also given as promotional gifts. Now, I work at the uh, uh, St. Joe Festival. And when we work in certain stands, we need an apron. And so, I think two years ago, the Matthew Hall Lumber Company donated aprons to everyone that worked in those particular stands. So, it was a donation to uh, St. Joe, but it's also advertising. They're advertising their business. Um, and then there were clerical aprons. You know, the white cassocks that the priests, not so much now anymore, they came down to the thighs. Those were called aprons in medieval times. And they started out long. But as they became missionaries, and they would go out into the countryside, they, they went on horseback. And so going on horseback, the long cassock didn't work. So they shortened them down to, just up to the thigh. And then when they rode their horses to go do their mission work, um, they, it was more comfortable. And it didn't get dirty at the bottom like a long one would have gotten dirty. They were, they were shortened to help the priest get on and off the horse. Um, and black was designated for the archdeacon. Of course, you know, the deacons, the archdeacons had to have something a little better than what the monk, common monks did. Purple was designated the bishop. And uh, I don't have a picture of that. But as I was looking at this, and maybe how famous this, um, I thought of Father Pierce. He was a missionary priest in this area. He uh, started many of the parishes. He, started, he did a mass at St. Joe. He did some at, at Jacob's Prairie. Can you imagine him coming down the road, horseback, wearing a white cassock that was summer, on a horse? It's quite a picture. Um, and these are aprons that are common in the home. Um, now, um, Kathleen, Dolores, you can sit for a bit. <laughs> Kathleen, you want to come up and show yours? Kathleen brought a few aprons that uh, are hers. And let's, I'll just let her show them to you. Thank you. Just tell us what they are. Okay, they, my grandmother made aprons for all of us. Um, these are my, my mother's aprons that uh, my grandmother made. Uh, my grandmother was born in um, the 1880s. She lived to be 96 years old, and um, she did all of her sewing was perfection. So these were my mother's, and um, this has stains on it, so um, it was used. <laughs> yeah, definitely used. And you can see with the gingham that um, she did cross stitch on this. The whole bottom here is cross stitch. All done by hand. Yes, all done by hand. This is a different color. This is just another color of basically the same design. And the checkered gingham, which was really popular in the 40s and 50s and even into the 60s. And this one she just did brick rack. Mm -hmm. And the, the and this one is was always my favorite because this one she did a total design on. I don't know if you can see that. But um, it's the white is just totally done with design. Can you imagine the time it took to do that in the waistband pocket at the bottom in an apron? An apron is supposed to be utilitarian, but she obviously loved her aprons. Okay, so those were my mother's. Now these are the ones she did for my older sister and I. And um, these are fairly washed out, but you can see that they're a whole lot narrower. And so we had these when we were girls. And this one is um, all of one color. And so these were nothing special, but um, my older sister didn't want any of these. And these she just made out of fabrics that were left over from blouses that she made for us girls. From the scrap box. Yes. We, um, 
we were not wealthy, obviously, and so Grandma made most of our blouses and dresses. So, and probably, these were our aprons. Probably on the feed sacks, flour sacks, or sugar sacks, where she got the material, it had to be washed to get the label off the back, and then you could use it for clothing, uh, aprons, anything. That's right. And then my brothers complained that um, how come we had aprons and they didn't? So she made this one, and <laughs> it was, you know, obviously a boy's. It was spaceships, and um, so I don't think boys wore it very much, but it because it still looks fairly brand new. But I always thought that was really pretty cute. So when um, some of these I took when I got married, but um, some of these we um, when we were dividing things after um, my mother was in the nursing home, I took this one because nobody else wanted it. I thought that was very cute. It's also a sort of a story iron, I, I, paper iron. I guess I bet it was iron uh, because it's got the rockets, the planets, the stars. So in a sense, it's also a story. I look how big it is. It's not a little guy. No, no. My brothers are all fairly big men, and um, the two that are left. And I think uh, my brother Jerry probably would have been the one that would have taken it. He ended up to be quite a good singer and uh, a semi-professional dancer. So um, anyway, that's very special to me. And then there's, I want to go back to this one. Uh, as I was doing my research, uh, I came across a little story about a man who said, aprons are really just loin cloths with a ruffle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll do this one later. Okay. Okay. She has a special one here, too. Okay, and this is also a utilitarian apron, although very pretty. But look at the, the combination there. She's wearing a flowered apron over a print dress, which, you know, wasn't quite acceptable at, at one time. But um, because it was utilitarian, it was used because she wanted to protect her body. Now, somebody else wrote, I think it was... Uh, I can't remember the feminist. She said, why were aprons uh, sewed so that they covered the most beautiful parts of the woman's body? <laughs> <laughs> this is a very, very pretty apron. It's a dressy Sunday apron. When uh, company came over in the old days, and still today, you want to look your best. But if you're cooking in the kitchen, you have to be a little bit careful. So they had very pretty aprons. This is probably an organdy apron uh, in the 1940s. Very pretty, ruffly, uh, very attractive, even if the woman didn't take it off when the company came. But when you think back to uh, TV in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, the women always wore aprons if they were in the kitchen. But I remember watching Aunt Annie with the Annie Griffith show, and Aunt B always wore an apron. But the minute the door, someone knocked on the door, she tore the apron off and hid it somewhere. She didn't want to be in public or have someone see her with an apron, although she wore it all the time. Okay. And these are more fancy aprons. Now, the one at the top is called a pity. Those were very popular in wealthy homes because the women wore beautiful dresses if they were serving. Those are the servers wore those, not the women in the kitchen or the men too in the kitchen. They wore the plain white apron usually. But the servers that would go out and actually serve the meal wore dressier aprons and they also had better clothing. And so the penny was pinned at the top to the dress. So the top was covered and she looked like a servant, like a server, but it was a beautiful dress, a beautiful apron. And look at the lace at the bottom. Uh, did, are any of you familiar with Downton Abbey, the series? Yes, if you notice, that's exactly what happened. The women in the kitchen wore the large aprons, the white aprons that were, they weren't afraid to be to have soil. But the women who served the food, you know, absolutely perfectly, uh, they wore the fancy pennies that were pinned to their dresses. And these are children's uh, aprons. And getting back to TV again, uh, Hansel uh, uh, and Gretel. Gretel wore an apron, if you look at the pictures. Uh, Dorothy wore an apron in the Wizard of Oz. That went up for auction about 10 years ago. 
the apron that Dorothy wore in The Wizard of Oz and sold for $140,000 at auction. And uh, Alice in Wonderland also wore an apron. Those were also called pinafores because they covered the front of, of the body. And my mother said when she went to school, uh, she had two dresses, one for Sundays and one for weekdays. And so she wore a pinafore. She had a number of pinafores that covered basically all of the dress. She wore over her school dress so that mom could wash, her mom could wash the pinafore, but she didn't have to wash the dress. And aprons are in toys. Raggedy Ann, the Raggedy Ann dolls. Raggedy Ann wore an apron. And that was a sort of a pinafore apron too. And then there had to be patterns. How do women make their aprons? Uh, there had to be patterns, and that was a pattern for a little girl with a beautiful dress, but she has a pinafore over the dress. And that's what I thought of. So she can come back. This is a child's apron. She's going to go back in two years. Just hold it in front of me. That's a child's apron. And see, you could, it had, it tied on top. I'm not going to be able to show. It tied on top. And, but then it had pockets for crayons or candy or what have you. Um, so that uh, she was going to stay clean, but she also had everything she needed. Also a handkerchief if she used a handkerchief. Okay, thanks. Um, so those were patterns. And these are the patterns for women. Lots of women knew how to do, uh, how to make an apron without a pattern. But they didn't have these patterns available. And there were, on each pattern, there were at least two versions of the same pattern, of the same apron or a similar apron, so that uh, um, they could have two different aprons from the same pattern and still look a little bit different here and there. Um, and when I was in high school, probably most of us here, um, we had to, had to take home back home economics. And in home ec, we had to learn how to sew. Later, the boys had to learn it too. But one of the first things we generally learned how to make was an apron. Because it was simple. Does anybody remember doing that? Just nodding her head. Yeah, so you made an apron. I remember my son took uh, home ec too, and he made a backpack, a denim backpack. But the girls made aprons. Simple. Do um, you have any comments, questions? I also want to talk a little bit about, in general, um, how aprons were used. Somewhere I have this. Um, when Grandma wore them, uh, she had probably a pocket or a couple of pockets, and she used them to bring in the eggs, pick up eggs, bring in the eggs, bring in the produce from the garden. The pocket probably had uh, small things that she found or a handkerchief and uh, 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 candy for the kids when they came outside. Or she could just pick up that apron and clean their noses when their noses were dirty or their faces were dirty. She had an apron and of course mom did too. Um, and uh, for, for various reasons, she, she, the apron was very popular and very important. I have a sheet here you can pick up if you like. It's um, the article that I wrote in 2004 uh, for the St. Cloud Times, and it's about aprons. So if you'd like a copy of that, then you can pick it up. And that's got my grand great grandmother on the picture. And then I wrote a poem about aprons, which pretty much describes, I think, how we remember our mothers and grandmothers. It's called the apron. When mother was a child, she wore an apron to school over the one wood dress she owned. At an early age, she learned to sew her own, simple, colorful, or plain white, from defects, flower sacks, or cheerful calico. In time, her home chest, into her home chest went the bed she was, organdy or sheer nylon with lace and ruffled edges to impress her suitors. She wrapped her babies in them, warm against her body, used them to wipe away tears and clean dirty noses and ears. A shy child could hide behind them, and the pockets would hold special treats. 
They served as pot holders, buckets, baskets, and bowls. Carried wood, cradled baby chicks, gathered eggs, vegetables, and apples. Easily laundered, they flapped in the breeze. Children played under them. Today, they help us to remember simpler times. They represent love and being loved. We like to touch them. We like how they make us feel. Oh, do you want to go up and show us? Come on up. Is that all right? All right. 